working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everybody, Zach Albetta here with another edition of the podcast Working Drummer. Today is a little bit of a change because my interview is with Cassandra Kirkosius, who is not a drum set player, but a percussionist. She is in high demand around LA in groups ranging from almost any type of world music you can think of to pop acts like Kanye West and Young the Giant. In addition to a lot of freelance work, she's also a member of the LA-based soul band Beat Mosaic. For most of high school and college, she was on track for a career in orchestral percussion, Uh, but then she fell in love with flamenco music, which opened the door to world music and hand percussion, and she never looked back. Uh, This story of how she carved her own career path as a world percussionist is pretty unique, and she has some great advice for us drummers about uh, what percussionists are there to do and, and how to play with them. Today's episode of the Working Drummer Podcast is sponsored by OnlineDrummer.com. OnlineDrummer.com provides drummers of all ages and skill levels with the best educational resources, including videos, sheet music, ebooks, articles, Skype lessons, and more. OnlineDrummer.com puts all these tools at your fingertips to help you improve your playing. Working Drummer Podcast listeners can get a free download of the sheet music of your choice by visiting OnlineDrummer.com and entering the promo code WORKINGDRUMMER. No dots, no spaces. Working Drummer. Again, go to OnlineDrummer.com and enter the promo code WORKINGDRUMMER for one free download of the sheet music of your choice. Get practice tips, build your chops, work out new styles, or learn your favorite song today at OnlineDrummer.com. So I've known Cassandra since she was in high school, and it's been really cool to see the journey she's taken since then and uh, the success she's having now. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Cassandra Kokosius. So you mentioned that your mom was a music teacher. Was that your first uh, introduction to music? Yes, definitely. My mom had a huge impact on... um on everything that I listened to when I was young, she would always take us to um, classical concerts, to the ballet. Um, and also my grandparents were also very into classical music, so it would always be around the house. Classical music and Greek music um, was always around the house. It's in the family. It's in the family. Can't yeah. help it. <laughs> and, um, and then my mom was also a cabaret singer, so she wow. used to drag us along to rehearsals. And so I was very up on kind of old standards. Um, she was, my mom also was very, very into Cole Porter and Gershwin. So Mm -hmm. pretty much it's kind of funny. Even, um, (laughs) we'll be listening to a jazz tune, my husband and I, and he'll be like, I'll be like, Oh, it's this tune. He's like, how, how do you know this? And I'm like, Oh, and I can sing all the words because my mom always listened to that. So I was always around it. Um, so yeah, she's definitely the one. And she always, we took piano lessons as a kid, um, I was in dance as a kid. Mm-hmm. I was a tap dancer as a kid. So it was very, very much a part of who I was. This this whole I was wondering how you got into flamenco, but like it 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 so makes sense now because it's a folk music which you were already hip mm-hmm. to because of your Greek heritage mm-hmm. and your mom was a singer. It's a very you know it's it's a music of song. Totally. Um, so cool. Yeah. We we met in Muncie, Indiana. That's right. Uh, I was I was a college student. You were a high school student, mm-hmm. both studying percussion. Um, is that where you grew up? Yes, I grew up in good old Muncie, Indiana. So you say that your your mom took you to the ballet and to the mm-hmm. all these concerts. Like was I don't I don't think of Muncie <laughs> as a place where a lot of that kind of stuff happens. Very but. true. I mean, every now and then stuff would come into town there, but we would go down to Indianapolis. We would go up to Chicago. We would go to New York. So see, we my parents were very. It was very important because we were, grew up in such a small town to get us out of there and to see what else the world had. Yeah. And we had a lot of family up in Chicago, so we'd be up there all the time. So having that. That was a really great thing that they they were great about getting us out of there and yeah. seeing other things. So um, Cassandra and I met um, when I was a, a college student studying percussion at Ball State University. Mm-hmm. She was uh, a high school student who mm-hmm. was such a badass that she was studying <laughs> with the college professor at Ball State University, who was Dr. Erwin Mueller. Who Best is, man in the world. He really is. <laughs> he really is. Um, so at what age did you start studying with Dr. Um, Mueller? I believe... I was, it was between 
eighth grade and my freshman year of high school. That early? Yeah. Wow. Um, and I remember I was studying with one of his students, Clay Arnett, who mm-hmm. had studied, who had gone to Ball State. And he, I studied with him for a few years and he was like, you know, you really need to, I think you need to start working with Dr. Mueller. And I was like, okay. So I went and met him and had a lesson with him. And of course it was amazing. He kicked my ass and it was awesome. And from that point on, I studied with him regularly throughout all of high school. Um, Now you say he kicked your ass, but, but he's like the nicest, sweetest little old man. So, so describe the ass kicking (laughs) that that Dr. Mueller uh, uh, dishes out to a person. He he does. He does. It's a very, it's an amazing style of teaching. He, um, you know, he would always just expect, you know, if you didn't practice, it was kind of like disappointing your, your favorite person in the world. (laughs) So it was just like, I'm not angry, but I'm disappointed. And he just was very, he expected a lot from you, Mm -hmm. but, um, he also was very kind and gentle. And if I was just like, Dr. Mueller, I'm just not getting this. He'd be like, all right, well, let's see how else we can get through this. And he was very supportive and, um, nurturing, very nurturing. And especially to me being, you know, I was 13 years old, like angsty teenager. He dealt with me beautifully. It was awesome. So what were, um, some of the the first uh, like higher musical concepts that you kind of became aware of with with Doc with Doc gosh um, I mean he was always all about I mean phrasing was something that you know especially as a percussionist when you start it's like ooh I'm just hitting things and mm-hmm. I'm making sounds and I want to be loud and big but he really focused so much on phrasing and the movement of a piece and I thought that was mm-hmm. that, that remember that sticking with me. Um, and um, also just kind of relating what you're doing to any other type of music and kind of seeing like, um, you know, because I did mostly a lot of classical marimba stuff with him or, you know, and and things like that. And he would kind of be like, oh, well, it's kind of like this Mozart thing or it's kind of like this. So you kind of listen to other music to kind of bring it in. And because a lot of these new music pieces are sometimes hard to find those points. Right. You kind of need to find a way to relate relate it to something else that we all know and have heard. And right. So that was pretty cool. Um, I think those are the big things. And then, I mean, non-musical things was always, he was always saying like persistence and patience. Mm-hmm. Those were the keys to everything. Yeah. So that's something that I always, um, always sticks with me, especially when I get frustrated. Yeah. Like, it's, it, he, he almost wouldn't let you get frustrated. He wouldn't. No. Um, I, no. I remember there was a, a one time, I think it was my senior year or my second senior year mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> where I had, I had been in a concerto competition and I, I just killed it. I just played the shit out of whatever piece I was doing and I didn't win. And I thought that like, I saw some of the other people who had performed and I, like, I really thought I should have won. And I came in the next day and, and doc was like, how's, how's it going, buddy? Everything okay? You seem a little, seem a little down. I was like, man, I'm just frustrated about yesterday. I, I really killed it and I feel like I should have won. Mm-hmm. And he just like, without missing a beat, just listed off all the other stuff I had accomplished in the last year. Mm-hmm. Well, you did this and you did that and you went that place and you won that thing and you won this. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. He is. He he's an amazing person, an amazing soul, yeah. and you know his students were are his kids, yeah. and so he just gosh. I mean, I, I feel so fortunate, especially during those formative years, to have in my have him in my life. Mm-hmm. Be interesting to see had he not been where I would be because yeah. he's really, really just amazing, amazing yeah. in that sense. So, do you feel like he kind of equipped you with the fortitude uh, to to go to Chicago because you Absolutely. went you went from high school studying with Dr. Mueller in yep. a little tiny town yep. to college at DePaul University in Chicago with a world-renowned professor and sure. program and sure so what was yeah that transition he, like? I mean he absolutely prepared me for that because he not only did Doc um, you know teach me lessons he had me included in the percussion ensemble right. he had me included in the um, when one of the wind orchestras one of the concert bands yeah. you know, the wind bands there mm-hmm. can't remember which one it was specifically now um but and then also even the marching band which i had never done my high school didn't have a marching band mm-hmm. so he really pushed me to be involved in that and then also in uh i took a lot of the courses which my high school allowed as well but doc kind of helped me get into them the music courses at the music school so i had taken so many college courses by the right. time i got to chicago i think you came to some house parties too but he didn't well he didn't there's that too that. but we'll edit that part yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
you went to DePaul thinking yes. that you're you're going to pursue this orchestral thing. Yeah. Like you're going you're yeah. to be auditioning for symphonies around the country yep. or maybe doing like a solo percussion chamber music type thing. Yeah. How long did that <laughs> last before you, wow. you caught the flamenco bug? Well, I, I started at DePaul and I studied with all these amazing um, teachers who were all either members of the Lyric Opera of Chicago or the Chicago Symphony. So mm-hmm. that was my world. I was in, I was studying excerpts and I was, you know, working on my snare drum chops and working on my xylophone chops, playing these excerpts. And, you know, I was doing it for about two years and I was just kind of pressing on. And I just, for, for me personally, and it's not to slam orchestral musicians because I mm-hmm. have so much admiration for them. It's I, I went to the LA Phil for the first time uh, the other night and I saw these guys and it was just like, you know, utmost respect. Absolutely. Like yeah. it's amazing what they do. But for me personally, I just didn't find the joy in music while sitting in a practice room practicing ep- excerpts that I may never play in my life. Mm-hmm. And I, to me, I was just like, I don't understand. Why is this not making me happy? Why is like, it was just so, and I know there's an, you know, element of hard work and, and that's not necessarily fun, but it just, I didn't see, even the few times I got to play in an orchestra, I just didn't, I just didn't feel that love that I used to have for music anymore. Mm-hmm. So my junior year of college, I um, went to PASIC, of course, good right. old PASIC. Right. And um, there was a percussionist there. Now, who he was, I don't know because I was still early in the game. And I, I honest to this day, I don't know who he was. But mm-hmm. he was a flamenco percussionist and he was doing a, a workshop on flamenco percussion. And he started playing um, Vicente Amigo tracks and Paco de Lucia, and he would kind of play along with them. And I was like, well, what is this? <laughs> it is the most amazing thing. It, like, it was something that I feel like I had known my whole life, but mm-hmm. I had never really heard. And mm-hmm. it was so incredible to me. And I, I was like, okay, I need, to, I need to get as much of this as possible. So I, when I came back from that, I um, bought every album I could find. I, I was like, oh, there's this drum called the cajon that's used in it. Sweet, I could be involved in this. So my, I, I wouldn't shut up about flamenco, and my mom finally sent me a cajon. It just showed up in the mail one day. And that's cool. she, she was like, well, if this is what you love. So I started playing, and I was just kind of playing along with tracks, and that's kind of how I how that transition happened. So when I was in school at DePaul, I started kind of veering away from the classical stuff, but then doing the flamenco and I was a little bit of the black sheep mm. in the studio because yeah. they're like, what, what are you doing? This is not, but I was told, and there were a few teachers were very, very supportive, but some were just like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Right. Um, so did, did you, you, you finished your classical I did. Degree. I did finish my degree and, but you were, you were leading kind of a double. Oh life, yeah. Like. I was totally a double. I was like a double agent <laughs> in the world. Totally. And, and it was funny. My, even my senior recital, I brought in a flamenco dancer and guitarist and that was like the final piece. And I remember my, my teacher after it was over, he was like, well, that recital was very you. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess. Thank um, you. <laughs> but it was, you know, the, but all in all, they all supported me pretty well. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, it was just, a, I took a completely different, different path. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, aside from becoming enamored with the, the music mm-hmm. itself, mm-hmm. um, you know the the life of a of a flamenco percussionist, or now I mean, you you do all kinds of pop rock stuff. Yeah, like that's a very different life from the life of a classical oh, musician. Yeah. So did did you get a taste of that in Chicago? Did you start yeah. gigging? Did you yeah, start- um, it was kind of interesting the way it worked. I so once I started learning teaching myself flamenco, I literally Googled flamenco Chicago, and I found this guy Jim Collinsworth, who was a guitarist and percussionist in town. So I started, I took a few lessons with him and he was like, you gotta have this shit down. Like, why don't you come to this workshop with me? And I went to this workshop and I was playing with this guy who is now one of my closest friends, Diego Alonso, who was an amazing guitarist in Chicago. Um, and that's where we met and we started playing together. He's like, you should come meet this. So it kind of like was a chain reaction. I just kept meeting people and meeting people. Mm-hmm. So through... Through that, I started playing flamenco. The one thing that I wasn't prepared for was improvisation. Uh-huh. Because as a classical percussionist, I never had to improvise. It was right. on the page. So when it was like, all right, Santa, take this solo, I was like, ah! I mean, I was <laughs> so scared. And I never had really properly been trained how to do it. Or I really, you know, yeah. it was it was a big struggle for me. And, I, you know, just I just kind of kept pushing through and kept pushing through. And I would take a shitty solo and be like, all right, next time I'm not going to do that. And then I would just kind of... 
What were your resources for that? Was that trial and error? Uh, or a lot there... of trial and error. I would listen, just listen and listen, listen to lots of records, whether it be flamenco or even jazz. I would yeah. try to get some ideas and like kind of try to get them in my head. Like, oh, that's a great, just that phrase. Okay, try to implement that the next time. Were drum set players relevant? That's, Absolutely. Who, who were you listening to? Oh, God. Um, well, at the time, because, you know, being a female, I was... Very into to Terry Lynn Carrington. Yeah, and you don't have I actually, to be a female to be. I know, Terry but Lynn even much. yeah, she's a badass. <laughs> but even as a woman, I was like, she's I don't, know, she's so great. And I got to meet her once. Uh, I used to work at the um, Symphony Center in Chicago, so I got to meet all these artists, and mm-hmm. it was awesome. So I would say like, I don't know, she was for some reason she struck a chord with me. So I I really liked her stuff. Yeah. Um, and then. <sighs> I honestly can't think of any specific other jazz people. I mean, the flamenco people I would listen to, um, uh, Luki Losada and Cepillo and Piranha and these guys that are just like absurd. And, mm-hmm. you know, and then kind of YouTube started coming around. So then you know, they had visuals of, of what they were doing and that was even cooler. And, yeah. Um, so stuff like that. I don't know. I just, and just anything, any idea I would just try to grab and kind of implement into my improvising. Cause I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Right. I, you know, so that that took some time, and I think once I finally actually moved to LA and went to Cal Arts, that's when I was able to kind of hone in right. improvising. So we're gonna get to that in yeah. a second. But you you spent a few years in Chicago yeah. after school. Yeah, right? so I spent like four or four or so years after DePaul, just gigging, doing flamenco. I was playing for the Ensemble Espanol in right. Chicago, which is this big. Um, flamenco ensemble they um they do flamenco and classical spanish dance so through that they would bring in a bunch of artists from spain so i got to work with all these amazing people carmela greco who's the daughter of jose greco who he was kind of one of the main in the kind of i think it was the 50s and 60s maybe 70s he um toured around the u.s with flamenco so kind Mm -hmm. of brought flamenco to the u.s in a more popular way um and she's amazing um and it was cool. I, I got to meet so many amazing people that way. So you were just a gigging flamenco percussionist. Yeah, pretty, at that time I was just that's insane flamenco. Because yeah. like for for someone to go to a town like <laughs> Chicago, yeah. and and say like I want to be a gigging bass player, or I want right. to be a gigging guitarist or drummer or whatever. Like that. I mean, if you achieve that, that's that's not nothing. That's right. a thing. But for a few years, you were a gigging yeah. busy flamenco yeah, percussion. It was crazy and looking back on it, it's pretty amazing. That's and really cool. There's a cool community there and um, very supportive and um, I mean, some of my closest friends are part of that group community yeah. and um, it's, yeah, it was really a cool time and I started, I had a trio with a guitarist and a singer um, called Idilio, which we did a few things for a few years and did an album and stuff like that and played out a lot and it was great. We, I... I I have to say I was um, very fortunate during that time to be there. So what led you to the decision to pursue grad school and and what uh, made you want to go Mm. to CalArts specifically? Um, Well, I through Flamenco, I started meeting um, people from um, other type genres of music, I guess. I started meeting a lot of Afro-Cuban people. I started me- meeting a lot of Middle Eastern, a lot of Indian. Mm-hmm. And I, we, I, we'd do these collaborations with them, but I'd always do it from the side. I was the flamenco person and they were the Middle Eastern or the right. Afro-Cuban. And I I loved that music so much and I wanted to learn more about it. So I started, started taking some lessons in Chicago, which was great. But it's kind of hitting a point. Um, my the one of the guys from my trio he decided to move to spain to study more flamenco and i was like yeah and i'd been thinking about grad school for a while and so finally i was like um i had seen actually once again at PASIC, i had seen a booth for cal arts so it kind of had always been on my mind and they mm-hmm. had this masters in world percussion mm-hmm. which is so cool because so many schools you have to do classical stuff to even remotely get into that world stuff. right or and, drum set the or other totally yeah totally and I and they had that and mm-hmm. this guy Randy Gloss who I had heard of a million times and he's you know very well known in in the percussion world he was the main teacher there and um, so I decided to audition and I was like what the hell why not and I sent in my tape and um, I got accepted and so it was kind of crazy it was kind of just kind of made sense I came out in April to check out the school met Randy he was amazing mm-hmm. and then moved out here in 
August, that following August. So right. it was really fast and really kind of sudden, but it felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and so your study there seemed like it was just all things uh, hand drumming. Yeah. Like, yeah, pretty much. I, um, I studied with Randy. We did Brazilian, we did, um, Middle Eastern, um, they had a whole Persian program there. So I studied specifically Persian drumming and music, wow. which was amazing. Yeah. Um, Balinese gamelan. They also had Javanese gamelan. I didn't do that, but I did mm-hmm. Balinese. Um, West African Ghanaian music, specifically Awe drumming, which was incredible. I actually got more into the dancing than the drumming yeah. from that because I just, I don't know, it was so amazing. And then the biggest, I think the biggest thing that kind of changed, well, there are a couple things. The change my the way that I play is North and South Indian hmm. because the way um, we studied I studied tabla but I also studied tala which is the rhythmic study right um, right and the syllables and the exactly yeah, yeah. and the way that they uh, combine you know the, the way that they look at rhythm changed the way that I looked at rhythm and I feel like it it changed me as a player and it was really cool um, yeah. and then I also did Latin stuff so I did Afro-Cuban stuff there they had a salsa band and I played in that and that actually my conga chops went up significantly during that time yeah. so that was pretty cool so is, is is there something about playing with your hands as opposed to sticks that, that spoke to you for some yeah, reason? Yeah, and I don't know why because I mean I love like every now and then I'll sit in front of a drum set and play and it's fun but to me like something about that connection with your hand on the drum and mm-hmm. even like the little bit of pain sometimes that you get like it I don't know what it is it's just like you really feel um a true like your hand is making that sound and yeah. it's so I mean I mean I guess it's not safe to say you know uh, clearly drummers can sound very different mm-hmm. with sticks with the same sticks, but with, you know, myself and my friends who have bigger bear paw hands, we sound different and we can mm-hmm. do different things. And I don't know. It's, it's very cool. It's, it's, it's almost like the, the difference between voices, literally. Yeah. Because you, yeah. Like, you can't do anything about how your voice sounds. Totally. It is your voice. Totally. Um, and even if, if you're playing with sticks or mallets or something, I think you can, you can definitely manipulate that. Totally. A little bit. Totally. Um, and just again, like it's, it's full circle how, how, um, you know, flamenco is is a it's songs, it's yeah. folk songs, yeah. and you're attracted to these sort of I types really of music am. Yeah. that are so down to earth and so rooted in folk tradition. Mm-hmm. And now you're talking about um, you know how it's your hand as opposed yeah. to someone else's hand. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's 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 cool about that and like even you know all the the injuries and this part of it and overcoming that it's a whole thing it's a whole how do you overcome that like what are the injuries you deal with i mean you get you you know cracks and then major calluses and then when you don't play for a while and you come back it's just like remember the days of marimba where our you know our nubbins would go down and then you have to build them back up it's the same thing and i mean with congas and stuff to a point, you kind of just have to play through it. There's nothing else you can do. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You, sometimes you can't be like, ooh, my hands hurt. I yeah. can't play. So you just play through it and put some tape on if you need to. I don't like to use a lot of tape because it's the same thing. I just I want my hands to build up. Right. Um, when I go get manicures, it's just... <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> do you get manicures? I do. Hell yeah. Re- Man, it's But I tell like... them not to b- bother that stuff. Okay. Because yeah. it seems like it would be a lost cause. Well, you know, it's, so true. It... <laughs> it's true. It's <laughs> true. Yeah. Yeah, I want nice looking nails. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, I don't know. It's a really cool... I love that connection with the drum. I think it's really cool. Coming out of Cal Arts, did, like wh- while you were there, you were there for two years. Mm-hmm. During that time, did you sort of formulate an idea of, of what you wanted your career to look like? Because in Chicago, it was just all flamenco all the right. time, and now you're in Cal Arts, which is basically in LA. Right. Um, was that not an accident? Like, did you come to Cal Arts because it was? Well, I mean, that was. I think had Cal Arts been in the middle of nowhere, I probably wouldn't have gone. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think I, I am always drawn to a big city. Mm-hmm. Um, but I honestly thought I was going to go back to Chicago or go to New York. Never in a million years did I think I'd be in L.A. Really? Never. I don't know why. I just... I kind of assumed that you you coming to Cal Arts was sort of like strategic, that no. you're going to make your way into L.A. after that. No. Or... I thought... I was like, oh, New York for sure. Wow. I was going to move and I, I... That was it. And then towards the end of my time in Cal Arts and I was making such great friends and connections, um, I, I kind of... Um, decided, I don't know, I was like, I'll give it a try. And then here we are. 
a few years later and I'm yeah. still still going. So yeah. it's it's Well what what made you say like I'll give it a try? Um I think uh I was just starting to get some work and connecting with people that I thought it, you know, it could be, go, it could go somewhere. And mm-hmm. I also saw the possibility in this town I and mean, it's endless. It is. I feel like in Chicago, you kind of hit a, hit a point. There's, mm-hmm. it's a amazing city and the music, there's an amazing music scene, but it's, um, I feel like you kind of, there's a ceiling. There, yeah. I felt the exact same way about Kansas city. Yeah. And it's awesome. But I, I think in LA, I don't know what the ceiling is. I'm still yeah, trying to figure it there, out. It's, there isn't one really, and there's no floor either. There's no, yeah, well, there's that too. <laughs> there is that too. Um, yeah, and I, I think that attracted me to. I was like, well, you have the entertainment industry here. You have all of the musicians' tours are based out of here. Mm-hmm. Not all, but most yeah. are based out of here, and the possibilities are endless. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I was like, yeah, why not give it a try? So, were your first connections here through school? Yeah. Yeah. And and what were the first sort of types of gigs that you did? Well, a lot of them were flamenco-ish. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I work, and I still work with this um, amazing guitarist um, named Vahagni, who's a Armenian flamenco guitarist, mm-hmm. and he incorporates, which is kind of funny, goes back to my love of folk music because he does Armenian folk music with flamenco, so it's like my dream scenario. And he's amazing, and so I've worked with him a lot, and I met him at CalArts. We were, as soon as I met him and he was in flamenco, we were like attached at the hip because he was like my homie, and we Mm -hmm. would play together all the time, and and I would actually, um, he would bring me to his lessons, which was also amazing because I got to study with um, this guy Miroslav Tajik, who's an incredible guitarist and I learned so much from him being a percussionist. Mm-hmm. He, he was very influential to me. And so I, you know, got to sneak, not sneak in, but I would go in with Vahag on his, on his lessons and mm. it was really cool. So I still work with him. So he's one of the, the main people. Um, I'm trying to think of other CalArts people. I'm in a band called Beat Mosaic and right. it's mostly CalArts people. Okay. Um, the lead singer Aaron Mo- Monique is a um, CalArts, and then our two horns, trumpet and trombone, Tony and um, Greg are CalArts, and then myself. So Right. So for, for a band like Beat Mosaic, and mm-hmm. I think you've done some other groups mm-hmm. similar, like mm-hmm. in the, you know, pop rock, mm-hmm. non-flamenco, <laughs> whatever. Mm-hmm. What is, what, like, what drums do you take? What's your rig? Do you my, just... my rig for that is um, congas, bongos, um, and then toys, shakers and tambourines and shaker rays and kashishi and anything that makes noise. Yeah. And I'm gonna, I'm starting to implement timbales a little bit in it. So oh, it's cool. more like, yeah, it's not anything like I used to do in Chicago. Yeah, I mean it's more more like a salsa. <laughs> it is. Setup. It's kind of like a modified salsa setup. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty sweet. So in, in the time that you've been in L.A., like, I don't know how much you did this in Chicago, but in, in L.A., you've been part of a lot of groups and a lot of projects mm-hmm. that include drum set. Yeah. So what, as you know, what, the reason I wanted to have you on this podcast mm-hmm. is, is that you're, you're not a drum set player, but right. you're, you're drum set adjacent. Yes. Literally and, and yes. figuratively. So what, what are some observations that you've made about yeah. drum set players and playing with them mm. as a percussionist? And, and are, there, yeah. are there generalizations you can make? or? Yeah, I mean, gosh, I've had such... I, I mean, for me personally, if my drum set player and I don't click, then it's going to suck. Right. Like, it's so important for me to have a connection with the drum set player. And um, one time I a very well-known percussionist, Munyungo Jackson, who Mm -hmm. is um, with Stevie Wonder. I was talking to him once, and he said, you know, the the percussionist is kind of like the fifth and sixth limb of a drum set player. Mm -hmm. So you have to think of yourself as the fifth and sixth limb of the drum set. Right. And and that kind of has stuck with me. So I'm always trying to, you know, accompany or, or... just add things kind of in between what the drum set player is doing instead of always playing the same. I mean, sometimes it's right. good to reinforce some sort of groove, but right. sometimes it's nice to add those things in between. Yeah. I think that is what I always strive to do. Um, it's challenging certain drum set players, especially um, drum set and cajon is a very difficult thing. Uh-huh. And I've done it, and some people I play with are amazing, and we it complements each other, but sometimes it's like... I mean, a cajon, basically, you can play it 
just like a drum set. So right. it's just kind of too much of the same yeah. thing. And it's a lot of the same timbres exactly. and ranges. And, exactly. Yeah. So that's a challenge. I think that's the hardest. Drum set and congas, drum set timbal. Well, timbales can be tricky too, but drum set and congas and stuff like that, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's have, pretty easy. Have you run into drummers who, who don't really understand what you're there to do? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what, what are some of the mistakes that, that drummers oh. have made? I mean, I think just overplaying. Mm-hmm. I think drum set players are used to filling up all of that space. Right. But when you have a percussionist with you, you don't need to. Like, I think it's... Um, or if you want to, in certain parts, trade off. Like, really communicate in the points where they want to fill up space and then allow the percussionist to fill up space. Yeah. Um, because otherwise it can just be too much. Yeah. And I... Yeah. I, I used to... Uh, if, if I was on a gig and a percussionist showed up, mm-hmm. I, I think in my younger years, I would have bristled a little bit because mm-hmm. I not not against that person sure. personally but I, sure. you know my drummer brain is now like oh well, I I don't get to do all my drummer stuff now right um, right but but now when a percussionist shows up I'm like great I don't have to worry about my fifth and sixth limb <laughs> totally you know, I can just worry about three or four yep and and you know make some music with this guy or gal absolutely um who are you some some of your favorite drummers that you've gotten to play with here um well, it was just for an audition, but I played with Oscar Seaton, and I it was like one of the greatest. Audi- I mean, I didn't get the audition, mm-hmm. but it didn't matter. It was the most. Inc- I was smiling the whole time playing <laughs> along with him because his groove was so good, and uh-huh. I was just. I probably looked like an idiot because I was just like grinning from ear to ear <laughs> playing with him. <laughs> but it was he was amazing. Who was the audition for? Um, it was for George Benson. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, I was in the final two, so that's cool. Well, good for I mean, you. and that's like you know, with um, that's that was actually one of the when I got that audition, it was kind of one of the things that I was like, ooh, there are a lot of opportunities here, mm-hmm. and you know, I got far along in it, and it was a great experience, and I got to meet his uh, David Garfield as MD, and they're mm-hmm. so cool, and it was awesome. It was a great experience, yeah. And even you know, it's kind of funny, like even though not getting it, I still learned so much. And oh yeah, yeah. It was invigorating, even. Right. Losing the gig, but who's who's the drummer in Beat Mosaic? Um, his name is David Celia, and um, he's actually he went to Berkeley, I believe. Okay. Um, he's a good guy, solid drummer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fun. We we work together well, and and um, you know, kind of same thing, kind of go back and forth. And did you have to find your way with him? Oh yeah, in the percussion drum set. It did, yeah, and especially because it's something we're you know we're working together so much. It's it's always a challenge, and sometimes. Yeah, you know, there are disagreements, of course, yeah. but um, that's that, that is an interesting point because L.A. is full of work. Uh, it's just these one-off gigs, right? And you'll meet somebody once and play with them and do that gig, and then that's it, right? Um, so how do you how, how do you sort of uh, approach a, a one-off gig like that, especially in your relationship with a drummer, right? Versus how you approach mm. a, st- a, a regular steady thing. Well, I think a regular city thing, you definitely have room to be a little more vocal and a little more like, well, I think it's this way. Uh-huh. Whereas a one-off gig, I feel like you need to be a little more flexible. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I mean, you're, you're there for that one time and to make the music and you don't want the music to suffer. So why let, like, well, I think it should be this tempo and I think it should be, like, just find some common ground and, and go with it yeah. for the one-off. Yeah. Um, I've had a few g- gigs with this guy, um, VJ Foster, um, or sorry, not Foster. VJ Fawcett is his name, mm-hmm. and um, he's another. He's an amazing drummer in town, and just he's another. I don't work with him a lot, but every time I work with him, it's just like, zing, and we just work together amazingly, yeah. um, and it's so fun. Yeah. It just feels good. So you grew up in a little tiny town, yeah, and uh, spent some formative years in a bigger place like mm-hmm. Chicago, and now in adulthood you're in like one of the biggest cities in the world, <laughs> yeah. LA. Um, how do you, what do you, what do you prefer? Like, do you, do you put great value on the place you live and how you feel there? Like, would you, mm-hmm. would you live in LA if you weren't doing, if you didn't have mm-hmm. a career here? Ooh. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I go back and forth about LA, mm-hmm. honestly. Sometimes I'm like, yes, it's so cool to be here. But sometimes I do kind of, wish I was in like a, maybe not back in Chicago, but some, some other city. Somewhere a little more down to earth. Yeah, a little more. Um, but I've also surrounded myself with amazingly down to earth people and you can kind of ignore the, the BS of the LA thing. I kind of came to the realization (laughs) recently that, uh, like when, when people ask you about LA, I'm, I'm just going to start telling people, 
everything good you've heard about LA is true. Yep. And everything bad you've heard about LA is true. So true. That's exactly <laughs> right. It's so, yeah, it's a strange city. It's not like anywhere else I feel. Mm-hmm. And, um, and like I said, I never thought I would be here and I'm happy to be here and the winters are amazing. Yeah. And what I winter? Yeah. What winter? Exactly. <laughs> and I mean, I do not miss running late for a gig because I'm digging my car out of a pile of snow <laughs> and scratching the crap out of my car. And yeah. Um, yeah, I don't miss that. Right. So that's cool. Um, but I also, I don't know. It's, it's, it's still, I mean, I've been here five years now and it's, it's, feeling more and more like home. Mm-hmm. I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would, if I got a great opportunity in another city, I would probably be happy to go there too. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not like, Oh, I have to stay in LA right. at all. Right. Uh, I have a, a friend who's a, a keyboardist in town, um, with a big touring gig. And, uh, I was talking with him a week or two ago and, uh, he he talked about you know L A L A is a place where you should get in and do your thing and get out <laughs> yeah. and that that was a new concept for uh-huh. me like I I thought of you know every most of the musicians I know here have been here for a long time or are planning to be here for mm-hmm. a long time mm-hmm. um, but he was like nope I'm I'm gonna do this for a little while and then I'm out <laughs> I respect that. What advice do you have for, because like you, you really carved your own career path (laughs) and we talked about, especially if you're in school, you're kind of presented with two choices. Either you go orchestral or you go drum set. Yep. Um, so, you know, other than going to Cal arts, cause that's too easy an answer. (laughs) Yeah. Right. What, what is your advice for some young percussionists who don't feel like they want to go either one of those routes? I mean, Gosh, I would say just find out wherever you are, like what, if whether you're in a big city or a small town, there are people who are interested in other things too. So maybe, you know, if you're not totally happy with just doing drum set or just doing orchestral, see what's around you, see what's in your in your neighborhood that you can get into outside of school and, and listen to other music, listen to as much other music as you possibly can and see what else reaches you. And, and I think it's possible if you are super into, you know, I don't know, South Indian music, find people who are into South Indian music. Don't, why not? I mean, mm-hmm. there's so many possibilities and it, and whether, and whether or not you become a South Indian musician, maybe if you're a drum set player that will affect your drum set playing or even your orchestral playing, your time and counting will be solid. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess just being open to, to finding what's in your area and not necessarily being stuck with what's in your school, mm-hmm. I guess, for, for a student. Um, but also, and one thing I kind of, my, <laughs> I wish I would have done more drum set. I think if you're wanting to go into any type of hand drumming or, or anything, I think drum set is a great foundation mm-hmm. um, for anyone. And I did some, but I... I should have done more, I guess. <laughs> well, it's not too late. It's not too late. And I should just go to the practice room right after this and go do it. So maybe I'll do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, I'm happy. Great happy to. to you. you too, of course. Cassandra's story is a good reminder to not just take an obvious route in your music career, uh, but really be intentional about figuring out what you're into and pursuing that. Um, and as you heard, sometimes that means discovering you're into something that you didn't expect and being able to let go of the path you thought you were going to take. A uh, really cool story. Check out Cassandra's website. Uh, lots of audio and video there of her in all kinds of groups. Uh, there's a link on the page for this episode at www.workingdrummer.net. Thanks to Merge Network. Check out the Drummer's Resource Podcast with Nick Ruffini and the Daniel Glass Podcast, which are also part of Merge, along with Working Drummer. If you would take a minute and leave us a rating and a review on iTunes, we'd really appreciate that. And as always, we appreciate you listening. See ya.